Right now, addressing sexual assault as another incident leads to the arrest of a Madison School District teenager. And it's NFL Draft Night from Nashville, Tennessee. The Packers, with two picks in the first round, will have an update on their first round choices in just a few minutes. Plus, to the nitty gritty or bus celebrating the 80 year milestone with a daytime journey to a local birthday favorite. From the Channel3000.com Alert Center, this is News 3 Now at 10. Thanks for joining us. A pair of new incidents at Madison schools. In one case, a 12 year old girl is accused of injuring two officers and is now facing tentative charges of battery to law enforcement. Officers say the girl hit a classmate and threatened another with a fire extinguisher yesterday morning. This was at Jefferson Middle School. Police say the girl was supposed to be suspended but refused to leave school grounds. Staff members requested help from Madison police and officers say the girl got into a fight with them. One officer was treated for whiplash and shoulder injuries and another suffered a split lip. In a second incident, a 16 year old boy now facing tentative charges of repeated sexual assault of one of his female classmates who came forward about him forcefully groping her over the course of several weeks. This is at least the second sexual assault we've learned of in the Madison School District in the last two weeks. And today, Amy Reed sat down with an expert to find out what could happen to stop all of this. Amy? At the Rape Crisis Center, it all comes down to culture, how we talk and act about sexual assault. They don't blame one person or even one type of person, which means the responsibility to fix this lies with all of us. I talk to young people in schools quite often and hear stories of them telling administrators or teachers and being told they're just being dramatic or given some other um, excuse for, you know, it wasn't, maybe it wasn't so bad, it wasn't as bad as they feel like it is. As the director of education for the Rape Crisis Center, Missy Mail may hear it more than any of us. It does break my heart. Actually, I just heard it today um, at a school. So I was, it was, well, these young girls are just very dramatic and it was a whole group of them telling me the story. She said that culture needs to change. According to her, multiple studies prove false reporting of sexual assault is only between 2 and 8 percent on par with other crimes. So we start by believing victims when assault happens, but there's more we can do before it ever does. What I would like to see is real honest conversations about um, sex, sexual assault, consent, especially consent. She said these conversations do happen to an extent in health class, but more can be done both there and at home. Right now, she's working with the Madison Metropolitan School District's Title IX coordinator to help train liaisons that can help with that. But more policies could go in place at the district level. MMSD policy says engaging in non-consensual sexual contact or conduct with another student carries their highest response level, which could lead to suspension or expulsion. But it's not clear what what their policy is for victims. So she encourages parents to ask for themselves. Ask your school administrators, what is the process if something happens to my child? What does it look like if they come to you and report it? What are you going to do about it? And step by step, you know, what, what, what will happen with my child in these instances? We reached out to the district to ask them these questions, but they weren't available today to comment. Mail said another thing parents can do to help combat this is to watch for warning signs in their children, including being withdrawn and not wanting to attend class. If you are worried about your child, Mail said you are welcome to reach out to the Crisis Center hotline. That number is 608-251-7273. Amy Reid reporting. Now, Amy, thank you very much. All right, I want to turn to weather now. It's just rain tonight, but that'll be changing Yep, to snow over the weekend. It may be enough to accumulate a little. Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti now with our first alert forecast. Gary? And the big question, of course, is how much snow are we expecting, if anything? But uh, the rain that we have tonight, not part of the same system. That's moving on out. And skies are actually clearing pretty nicely out to the west of us. Uh, low temperatures this morning, generally in the lower to middle 40s, although some upper 30s uh, were found to our south and east. Look at these high temperatures, very comfortable. Madison hit 70, Monroe 71, Janesville 73. It was cooler to the north and west because they were underneath the cloud cover longer. Uh, but current temperatures now are in the middle 40s to around 50 degrees. Skies are clearing to the west. That's why the temperatures are a little colder there. But take a look at Saturday. Rain may change to some slushy wet snow, especially in the afternoon and evening before it comes to an end. Right now, our thinking is still about one to three inches of snow, mainly on grassy areas through much of southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois, and eastern Iowa. 
Not tomorrow, though. Look for sunshine to return. Uh, skies, like I say, clearing out overnight. We'll be down to about middle 40s by early tomorrow morning, but look for a high temperature of 62 for tomorrow. Be a little windy during the day. That's your news for now. First alert forecast. All right, Gary, thank you. Tonight, of course, round one of the NFL draft from Nashville, Tennessee. The Packers hoping to cash in on that deal that gave them two picks in the first round tonight. Sports director Jay Wilson joining us now with an update on what's happening down in Nashville, Jay. Big night. A lot of things happening. Yeah, the Packers haven't had many draft picks in the top 15 the last few years but this year after not making the playoffs they have two picks in the first round including the 12th overall and with that 12th pick the Packers take Michigan defensive end Rashawn Gary. The Packers need someone who can pressure the quarterback from the edge and Gary, Gary certainly did that in Michigan. He was first team all Big Ten as a junior then left before his senior year to enter the NFL draft. The Packers say Gary will start his NFL education in the outside linebackers room even though he's listed as a defensive end an indication of his mobility and his ability to put pressure on the quarterback. Packers then traded up for their second pick in the first round. They sent the 30th 114th and 118th picks to Seattle to get the 21st pick and take a safety Darnell Savage from Maryland. They'll have just the first round of the draft tonight then resume with the second and third rounds tomorrow in Nashville. Eric. All right Jay thank you very much. A big name has just entered the race for president. Former Vice President Joe Biden now officially the 20th Democratic candidate in the running. He made that announcement in an online video. Biden will hold his first campaign rally in Pittsburgh Monday. President Trump wasting no time weighing in tweeting quote welcome to the race sleepy Joe if you make it. I will see you at the starting gate. Russia's president wedging himself into the conflict between the U.S. and North Korea. Vladimir Putin hosting Kim Jong-un in their first ever face-to-face -face meeting today. Putin said Kim agreed to give up his arsenal, but only if North Korea gets international security guarantees. Analysts believe Kim is trying to rally Russian support to show North Korea has powerful allies after talks with President Trump failed earlier this year. North Korea has reportedly billed the United States $2 million for what they say is the medical care for Otto Warmbier. He's the American college student who was held prisoner there. North Korea reportedly insisted the U.S. sign a pledge to pay the bill before releasing Warmbier from custody. Warmbier was in a coma when he was released back in 2017. He died six days later. The U.S. has not paid that bill. Five years ago today, the drinking water source in Flint, Michigan, was switched, setting the stage for what became a water crisis. It is a day that remains fresh in the minds of those still struggling with the effects of the lead contaminated water, a crisis that played out on the national stage. That city's water quality has improved over the years, now meeting federal and state regulations. Governor Tony Evers is looking for candidates to replace the Iowa County District Attorney who passed away unexpectedly last week. Larry Nelson suffered a pulmonary embolism while at his office last Wednesday. Learn more about this story at channel3000.com. A Wisconsin native will now lead the Catholic Diocese of Madison. That is Donald Hying, who will succeed the late Robert Morlino as bishop. Prior to his new role, Hying served as bishop of the diocese in Gary, Indiana. Originally from West Dallas, he says it is great to be back in his native state. Parishioners believe he will be a more collaborative leader than Bishop Morlino. He says he plans to visit every parish in the diocese this year. A long journey for a Middleton man today for a milestone birthday. Paul Schwister celebrated his 80th today, walking a little more than two miles from his apartment at a senior living center to Middleton's Nitty Gritty. His daughter and granddaughter walked with him, wearing signs saying Nitty Gritty or Bust. Once he arrived, he celebrated, of course, with his free birthday beer. He says the last time he went to a Nitty Gritty it was in Madison. That was for his 50th birthday 30 years ago, but that time it was a six mile trip. Tonight, also an important night for moviegoers. Thousands pouring and been waiting a long time to pour into theaters for the premiere of the movie Avengers Endgame. Marcus Theaters, based in Wisconsin, says at both Point Cinema in Madison and Palace Cinema in Sun Prairie, 75% of their screens are dedicated to this movie. They say just between today and tomorrow, they are showing it more than 300 times at just those two locations. Marcus says if demand continues to grow, they will even add more showings. And still ahead tonight, Gary will have his complete forecast, including a closer look at those chances for snow this weekend. But first, scammers target a local woman shortly after she lost her husband. Her call for action. That story next.
Welcome back. We are sharing a warning from a local woman who says scammers tried to take advantage of one of the worst moments of her life after her husband's death. And it all started with his online obituary. Leah Linscheid has her call for action tonight. This story starts. He was a wonderful man. With the end of another one. He gave everything he had to everybody. A love story between March Kittleson and her husband, Lowell. He worked hard, he played hard, and he loved hard. After 15 years of marriage, Marge lost her husband last month. He was known by so many people. <laughs> he had a heart of gold. The next few days were a blur of funeral meetings and mourning. He passed away on a Saturday. We met, the family and I met with uh, Crest Funeral Home on Sunday. And on Monday night, the day the obituary hit social media. It was that same night that Marge received a phone call. The caller ID said Cress Funeral Home. And this woman said to me, I'm preparing the death certificate and I want to make sure that it's perfect. That woman knew every detail, down to Lowell's birth and death date, his family members, his age, everything but his social security number. She rattled off a number that could have easily been a social security number. And I said, that's not even close. And she said, well, I wonder where I got that from. Well, what is the social security number? All of a sudden it hit me when she said, well, I really want to get this done. When Marge asked more questions, here's the answer she got. Nothing. Click. All because of an online obituary honoring her husband's life. Someone had almost been able to take advantage of his death exploited, concerned for myself and my family, but also for all of the people that are going through a death to have to deal with something like that. Because your mind is in so many places. Oh, yes, yeah. Funeral scams uh, have been common for decades. Madison College professor Steve Knoll has taught his students about this type of fraud dating back decades. With the age of social media, that has actually gotten a lot worse because you post stuff and now these scammers can be literally from anywhere. They could be anywhere around the world. The goal? To take advantage of your vulnerability, the loss of your loved one, for identity theft. Here are some red flags, but one of them isn't your caller ID. When you get that call, you need to confirm that the person is who you think you're talking to. And you can't just say, oh, my caller ID had the name of the business on it. This is exactly what happened to Marge. Cress's number had been spoofed. Here's another cause for concern. Let me get this information that you need and I'll call you back. And if they say, oh, no, 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 don't hang up. I need it right now. That's a big red flag. Timing is everything. If they're pressuring you to give them the information right now, that is almost always going to be aiming for a scam. Even in emotional times, Steve says, remember to think before you act. Because you have to remember, scammers don't care how you're doing. That's the reason you're being scammed, is they know that you're being vulnerable. There's a special place in hell for them. I can't say on air what he would say about it. <laughs> the moral of this story is simple. Ask questions, be skeptical, and when in doubt, just hang up the phone. In Stoughton, with this Call for Action report, I'm Leah Linscheid for News 3 Now. And Marge says she told Crest Funeral Home about the scam, and the company has since included a warning about this type of fraud when it talks with families dealing with a death. And this weekend, News 3 Now is hosting a special event to help protect your identity. Shredfest is Saturday, 8.30 a.m. until 11 at Warner Park. We're offering free document shredding in partnership with Pelletieri and the Better Business Bureau. For more information, go to channel3000.com slash shredfest. And even if the weather's bad, we invite you to come out and join us. We'll be out there taking your documents, and Gary's going to do his best to make sure we're not under a, yeah, a three well, inches well, of snow. I was out You'll there this year. Right? I'll be out there this year. You, know, you shred all those documents, and you know, it looks like snow. You'll need to bundle <laughs> Yeah. We may end up with some real stuff. You'll need to bundle up, though, huh? Yeah, pretty chilly day out there expected for Saturday. Tomorrow, though, not too bad. Rain showers came through tonight, or this uh, late afternoon into this evening. Uh, cool the temperatures down. Now those showers are just about out of our viewing area. Uh, they'll be gone within about the next half hour or so. Skies are actually clearing out to the west, so uh, we should see a pretty nice day. Now we take a look at what's going to happen beginning on Saturday. This is 6.30 in the morning. Notice precipitation approaching the Mississippi River. It's possible it could be an isolated rain or snow 
shower already in southwestern Wisconsin. But as the precipitation shield moves toward the east, notice the temperatures. They're in the lower 40s through the uh, morning hours, but where the precipitation starts picking up in intensity, those temperatures drop. They're still slightly above freezing, so you see a mixture of rain and snow. And then as we head through the day on uh, Saturday into Saturday afternoon and Saturday evening, that precipitation changes over to mainly snow or a mix of rain and snow, and then gradually ends Saturday evening. Now, a couple things to consider. The warmth of the ground, that will initially melt some of the snow that falls. If the temperatures stay a couple degrees warmer, we may not see any snow accumulation at all. If it's a few degrees colder or the precipitation starts a little earlier, then we probably would see a little more precipitation. And then depending on how long it lingers into the evening hours, that will also determine if we get a little more snow because at that point we'll mainly see snow. But everything should be gone by uh, around midnight or so Sunday morning. And on Sunday, we're back to uh, sunshine. Notice the temperatures early Sunday morning, a little bit below freezing, but those temperatures will warm up pretty quickly into the 40s and we'll see uh, upper 40s to around 50 and should melt what snow there is. As far as precipitation amounts, the very latest computer models are pushing the heavier precipitation even farther to the south. And again, this is something to keep in mind because the heavier the precipitation, if it's in the form of snow, you'll get a lot more snow as a result. But it's actually keeping the areas north of Madison with very light precipitation, and that would limit the snow accumulations there. From Madison southward, that's where most of the precipitation will be, and a lot of that will be in the form of rain before it changes over to snow. So the very latest computer models are actually pushing that snow area a little farther to the south, keeping the heaviest snow accumulations across parts of Iowa and Illinois. But some of this may melt as it hits the ground initially. So again, these totals might be a little bit on the high side, but it does bear some watching. We have an alert day in the forecast for Saturday for windy and colder and rainy uh, conditions that will gradually mix with and change the snow in the afternoon and about one to three inches of snow accumulation likely mainly on grassy surfaces through Saturday evening. Look at the Crazy Legs Classic. Rain, windy conditions. It's going to be a chilly day out there. The uh, time lapse from the WIC Sky Camp showed some sunshine this morning. Then the clouds started to roll in. We had some showers and the showers gradually came to an end uh, late in the evening. Live view from the Edgewater Sky Camp in downtown Madison. The rain is gone. Skies are actually starting to clear out. Our almanac for today shows a high temperature of 70 and a low of 42. But now our temperature has dropped back to 50 degrees. Our forecast for tonight calls for those lingering showers to end. Then skies will turn mostly clear. Low temperature dropping to 43. For tomorrow, look for a high temperature of 62. Be a little windy during the day, but all in all, plenty of sunshine. The rain moves out tonight. Temperatures drop to the low 40s. Highs tomorrow in the lower 60s. Then for tomorrow night, the clouds start rolling back in. Here comes that mix of rain and snow, especially during the day on Saturday. Uh, temperatures uh, dropping into the mid 30s by Saturday afternoon. Rainfall amounts heaviest to the south. Snowfall amounts inch to maybe two or three inches, mainly on grassy areas. Seven to 10 day forecast. Temperatures warm back up to 48. So what snow does accumulate will start melting on Sunday. It'll be gone by Monday and Tuesday. Temperatures back in the 60s by the end of next week. Some shower and thunderstorm chances and maybe up to 70 by the following weekend. So you go from 42 one Saturday to 70 the next Saturday. Yeah. Which one would you want? You're right though. <laughs> That crazy legs. Boy, I know runners like it a little cool. I don't know if they not, like it this not cool. Not that cold and, and not with the rain. Right, that's going to make it a challenge. Gary, thank you. Packers go all about defense in the first round tonight. The story coming up in sports.
The NFL draft begins tonight. They're just doing the first round tonight. The Packers have two picks in the first round. They go defense with both of their first rounders. Here's what the Packers draft room looks like tonight. General Manager Brian Gutekunst is directing his second draft as the guy in charge. Matt LaFleur is in the room for the first time as the Packers head coach. And the big boss, team president Mark Murphy, looking on going, hey, you guys better not mess this up. The Packers had the 12th overall pick, and they took defensive end Rashawn Gary of Michigan. He's 6'4", 277 pounds. As a senior in high school, he was the number one recruit in the country. He went to Michigan, was first team all Big Ten last season as a junior, then gave up his final year of eligibility to enter the NFL draft. There have been reports that Gary has been dealing with a torn labrum, but the Packers say they viewed Gary as a top 10 talent and got him at number 12. They need a pass rusher, and Rashawn Gary fits the bill. You know, he's got... Rare gifts, you know, guy that size who runs that speed and moves on his feet like that, and he can really bend. Um, you know, he's a guy, he, he commanded a lot of attention at Michigan. You know, double teams, triple teams. So it's Rashawn Gary with the 12th overall pick. With their second first-round pick, the Packers trade up. They send their 30th, 114th, and 118th picks to Seattle to get up to 21, where they take Maryland safety Darnell Savage, who was second team all Big Ten last season. With the first pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Arizona Cardinals select Kyler Murray resplendent in his pink suit and white tennis shoes. Everyone figures the Cardinals will now trade their current quarterback, Josh Rosen, who they took with the 10th overall draft pick last year. Here are the first five picks tonight after Murray. Ohio State's Nick Bosa goes to the 49ers. The Jets took Alabama defensive tackle Quinnen Williams. The first surprise, Oakland took Clemson defensive end Cleland Farrell. And Tampa Bay goes with LSU linebacker Devin White. No Badgers drafted yet, but offensive lineman Michael Dieter could be in line to go in the next couple of days, probably in the second to fourth rounds. Dieter's strength is his versatility. He can play center guard and tackle. He's ready to find out where he's going to go. You know, I'm just excited to get back to football. You know, it's been uh, the underwear Olympics, the combine, all that stuff, all that weird stuff that goes into it. I'm excited to figure out where and, and just get back to football. But, I mean, everyone in the family is excited, a little bit nervous, but... It's going to be a lot of fun. The Bucks and Celtics begin the second round of the NBA playoffs Sunday at noon in Milwaukee. Today, Bucks head coach Mike Budenholzer confirmed Malcolm Brogdon, who's recovering from a plantar fascia tear, won't play in at least the first two games of that series. And at Wrigley Field, the Dodgers visit the Cubs. John Lester came off the injured list, pissed pretty well. The only run he gave up was unearned because Javier Baez booted this grounder to bring home a run. Final score, Dodgers 2, Cubs 1. Brewers are off tonight. They'll play the Mets in New York tomorrow. We'll be right back.
Gary returns. Final check of our forecast. Well, the rain showers are moving off to the east. You can see they're pretty much out of our viewing area now. Uh, temperatures right around 50 here in Madison, a little cooler out to the west. Our skies are actually clearing. Look for a sunny day tomorrow with a high of 62, but Saturday, the high of 42 in the morning. Rain mixing with and changing the snow in the afternoon. Probably about one to three inches of a slushy accumulation on grassy areas. And those temperatures slowly warming up with some rain chances next week. By the following Saturday, it'll be up to around 70 degrees. We get uh, more drafts tomorrow. Maybe some badgers start to, to go maybe, a little bit. Maybe, maybe. Second it, or third round. Maybe, yeah, maybe. It's, a, it's certainly a fun time for those families as they try to figure out where they're going. And thanks for joining us tonight. News 3 now at 10. Have a good one.